Newcastle Manchester seminar series where uh, we're sort of delighted that each month we get a range of, of different perspectives on the climate change challenge from leading researchers and practitioners across the field. So today I am particularly excited to be able to introduce a talk by Dr. Stephanie Stadero about medical supply chains in the climate emergency. Um, so this is an example of how vital mobilities relate to climate change impact and it's a, a really kind of new and different area for one of our Tyndall seminars. So Stephanie is a lecturer in responses to climate crisis at the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute at the University of Manchester and Stephanie brings together the fields of climate change, mobility and health to research vital mobilities, movements of people, goods and information that impact life chances. So we're going to hear from Stephanie, I think, for around kind of 40 minutes, and then we'll have 15 minutes or so at the end for questions and answers before um, finishing at, at 2 p.m. Um, you can ask, ask questions in two ways, either add those to the chat or um, I suppose raise your hand either face to face or using the Zoom hand. Um, but please, yeah, please add quest ask questions at the end of the presentation. And please be advised also that we are going to record this seminar. Um, so yeah, uh, over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Sarah. I was advised 20 to 25 minutes for my talk, so I'll aim for that, but maybe okay. there's a room if I go a little over. So uh, we'll take it from there. Does that sound all right, Sarah? Yeah, no, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen here. And from the beginning, can everyone see my slides? even. Yes, that's great. That's, all right. Thank you again, Sarah. So my name is Stephanie Sodro, and today I'm going to tell you about my research on vital mobilities in a changing climate with a focus on blood, saline, and oxygen. So the impetus for my research came out of my doctoral studies looking at the impact of hurricanes in Atlantic Canada. This image is from the easternmost part of Canada called Newfoundland. And this is the type of damage caused by one hurricane. It resulted in road and bridge washouts, isolating more than 100 communities for up to 10 days. And one of the nuggets that stood out to me from my interviews was with an NGO representative who said simply, we needed to get supplies from here to there. And these supplies ranged from bottled water and cots to medical supplies such as insulin and methadone. This led to my current research question, which is how are medical supply chains impacted by a changing climate? Today, I'll walk you through my theorization of vital mobilities and then focus on blood supply chains and saline IV su supply chains, um, particularly and touch on oxygen uh, before concluding. So first, vital mobilities. My research is situated within the mobilities paradigm, which looks at the acknowledges and highlights the role that mobilities of people, goods, information, carbon molecules play in contemporary life. My particular interest is in emergency mobility. Geographer Pete Aidy states that whether in flight or in response, emergencies demand highly intensive forms of movement that radically transform one's life chances and quality of life. Aidy's interest is in the governance of emergency mobilities with a focus, for example, on evacuation. My, I've introduced vital mobilities as a sister concept with a material focus. I define vital mobilities as movements that impact life chances. They are external societal mobilities that enable critical internal bodily circulations, such as donated blood, saline IV solution, and medical oxygen. In thinking through vital mobilities, I th use three lenses. First, the everyday mobilities. What is, this, what, uh, what is the social life of medical supply chains? How do these vital mob mobilities circulate in everyday contexts? What are actual and potential sources of disruption and related contingencies? And looking forward, how are and how should vital mobilities be prioritized? 
And theorists that I lean on in my work include Ade's work on the in, what he terms the inescapable pairs of emergency and mobility. Bennett's work on vital materialities. She describes the vibrant materialities that course alongside and inside humans. And for me, that hi highlights the external circulations that enable internal bodily circulations. I draw on Deborah Cowan's work on the social life of circulation and just-in-time geography and Omar Devachi's work on therapeutic landscapes. So to get into the substance of things, the first case I'll share with you is that of blood supply chains. My entry point to this topic was learning that drones are used to transport blood in Rwanda. And as someone who's interested in, um, mobilities and disasters, this um, was really piqued my interest. But as I sat with this idea, I realized that I did not understand how blood circulated in normal non-drone circumstances, um, nonetheless using drones. And I ended up conducting field work in Vancouver, Canada. And my main question during this field work was simply how does blood get from the point of donation to the point of care? What does that look like? And I used interviews, facility tours, participant observation and document review to explore this question. In short, what I found is that my Initial understanding of how blood supply chains worked, something like this image was inaccurate. Uh, and this is a far more accurate representation of blood mobilities. The blood supply chains are dynamic, complex, and surprisingly geographically diffuse. This is an excerpt from an illustration of my work on blood supply chains that I recently conducted with a Methods for Change project here at University of Manchester. And the key point I wanna highlight here is the, an example of the mobilities entailed in these blood supply chains. So for example, if you were to donate blood in Vancouver, the Canadian Blood Services takes a bag of your blood and um, three or four test tubes of your blood. These test tubes are flown uh, in the middle of the night from Vancouver, 1000 kilometers east to Calgary, where they're tested. And if they're proven safe, then the bag of blood sitting in Vancouver is released for production and circulation throughout, um, throughout the region. Zooming out to the scale of Canada, if you donate blood anywhere in Canada, it goes to one of two centralized testing facilities in either Calgary or Toronto. So the carbon footprint and the mobilities entailed and hidden, invisible within these blood supply chains is notable. Further, of the blood donated in Canada, a portion is sent to South Carolina and Spain for processing into refined blood products, such as factor eight used by hemophiliacs. And then those materials are sent back to Canada. So adding thousands of kilometers to the supply journey and inflating the carbon footprint. While I was conducting my field work in Vancouver, there was a winter storm, which is hardly remarkable. Uh, it was not even a named storm. It was just a slightly above average winter storm for the region. Um, however, it was significant in my research in that there was a vehicle transporting 90 bags, 90, 90 bags of donated blood from an interior city, Kelowna, to Vancouver. The truck was stuck en route due, the, due to the snow and ice conditions, and uh, the blood could not be processed within the required 24 hour window. And those 90 bags of donated blood had to be wasted. I spoke with um, a lifelong employee at Canadian Blood Services in this region, and she said that was the first instance that she had experienced of this um, severe weather disrupting the blood supply chain. But it piqued for me this question of how blood, uh, medical supply chains generally are impacted by severe weather events. Leaving Vancouver and flying over to 
uh, England, the UK. This is an interior shot of the largest blood processing facility in Europe. It's based in Filton near Bristol. Um, it's if you if of all the blood donated in the UK of, in England specifically, 50%, one half is tested or processed at this site. So again, that centralization of, and concentration of facilities that we saw in Canada. Additionally, it's home, this facility is home to um, several specialist organizations such as the National Cord Blood Bank uh, and the British Bone Marrow Registry. This facility was built in 2008 and it flooded in 2012. There was above average uh, rainfall in August, September and this uh, flood facility flooded at 9 a.m. starting at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. This required the evacuation of hundreds of employees, all of the blood products and the specialized equipment used on that site. The um, service, the facility was out of service for two weeks. The disruption was managed behind the scenes. Um, so the, uh, the workload was distributed to other sites uh, and patients and health professionals did not even know that this had occurred. Um, but it's suggestive of, suggestive of the type of disruption that can occur and potentially at quite a significant scale. Another example is Storm Desmond, which impacted Northwest England in 2015. This was a flooding event that resulted in road and bridge washouts and the repair of those roads and bridges uh, took uh, several months in a number of cases. And there was one blood donor facility long established that was in a place that was no longer accessible due to these washouts, neither staff nor donors could get there. The, um, and as a result, that facility was closed, resulting in a reconfiguration of the blood donor network. A relatively small example compared to the Filton flood, but a far more common, uh, likely common example of the dis disruptions that can happen to these supply chains. So the vulnerabilities, uh, Specific to blood supply chains include the push towards consolidation and centralization, uh, questions around facility design standards, having such a mega facility um, that was susceptible to flooding near Felton, uh, out of date contingency plans, the challenge of keeping these contingency plans up to date, and all of these were exacerbated by a severe, severe weather events, winter storms, flooding. In terms of an enabling vital mobilities. Options include evaluating localization and re-evaluating re the merits of localization and regionalization of operations. Decarbonizing the distribution network, including fleets, updating contingency plans, and having plans in place for recruiting donors in the case of uh, disruptions. So that brings a close to the story of blood mobilities, blood supply chains. Now I'm gonna shift gears into looking at saline IV solution. So saline IV solution, salt water, is a mundane, ubiquitous material that's the backbone of, part of a backbone of the Western healthcare delivery. It's used in delivering medications, hydrating patients, resuscitating patients, and irrigating wounds. This is an example I stumbled on upon by chance. There's one company in the United States called Baxter International. They produce 50% five zero one half of saline IV solution for the United States. And it's important to note here that uh, do the American Food and Drug Administration does not require pharmaceutical companies such as this to disclose uh, production sites or um, to have contingency plans in place in the case of disruption. Baxter International Saline Production, I, uh, learned it takes place in Puerto Rico, which positioned itself as a low wage, low tax region starting in the 1970s with a view to attracting the pharmaceutical industry. 
and Puerto Rico itself is an unincorporated territory of the United States. So a range of pharmaceutical and medical supplies are produced in Puerto Rico, everything from um, scalpels to pacemakers, as well as saline IV solution. So in addition to being a hub for pharmaceutical production, Puerto Rico is also located in Hurricane Alley. So hurricanes form off the coast of Africa near Cape Verde, make their way across the ocean, gaining or losing strength, and then hitting the Caribbean, including Puerto Rico. And this was the case with Hurricane Maria, which hit um, Puerto Rico in 2017. It was a category five hurricane. And you can see here the scale of the damage overall, but specifically the pole and wire above ground uh, electrical grid. Here is an image. The bottom image shows the power outages resulting from Hurricane Maria. Um, <laughs> Puerto Rico imports the vast majority, 98% of its uh, fuel for electricity production, fossil fuels for electricity production. These are imported to one of these islands to the, uh, the right. I'm unsure which one. If, there, if there's anyone here with Puerto Rico expertise, I'd love to chat. Um, on one of these islands, the um, electricity is produced and then transmitted by a subsea cable to the mainland Puerto Rico. This subsea cable was damaged by Hurricane Maria. So both the above ground and subsea electrical grid were uh, destroyed. Um, in addition, due to the political dynamics um, that played out between Puerto Rico as an unincorporated territory and Washington and President Trump at the time, um, resulted in these power outages remaining for a period of not hours and days, but weeks and months into above six months in many cases. The New England Journal of Medicine estimates that 4,500 deaths resulted from the failure of the electrical grid following uh, Hurricane Maria, particularly the lack of electrical, um, lack, the impacts of the lack of electricity on the healthcare system. And this speaks to the vital mobilities of electricity in healthcare provision. In terms of saline IV solution, it seems like such a simple material, salt water, how hard could that be? But it goes through multiple stages, all requiring electricity for purification. When the electricity grid went down, uh, saline IV solution production stopped. And I should note that many of these facilities had generators and fuel, but these were um, intended to last for, again, hours and days and not the months that actually turned out to be the case. Due to these uh, the power failures, there were shortages of saline IV solution on mainland United States so that healthcare providers were forced with uh, confronted with conserving saline IV solution supplies. So a healthcare practitioner would have to go through the roster of patients in a hospital and ask which of these patients are using saline IV solution for the purposes of uh, rehydration. Uh, if so, can we move them over and give them Gatorade instead? Or are they receiving the saline IV solution to get medication? If so, can we inject the medication via syringe directly into their IV line? This is more time consuming and requires more skill, um, but was used so often that there was actually downward pressure on syringe supplies as a result. So the vulnerabilities of saline IV solution supply chains are, again, numerous. There's issues re related to monopolies, lack of transparency in the pharmaceutical world, uh, lack of contingency planning. In Puerto Rico specifically, in this case, there's a, a very centralized power grid that's reliant on external imported fuel. Um, the political injustices that Puerto Rico experiences um, given its liminal political status and then layer on a category five hurricane and uh, that's a recipe for disaster. 
The possibilities for enabling vital mobilities in this context include the, the quick and dirty upstream, for example, um, ensuring that all available product is uh, exported before a storm hits, ideally, obviously, ensuring that the local population has the supplies that they need, ensuring that there are generators and fuel supplies, but as seen with the case of Hurricane Maria, that's of only limited use um, if the power outages last uh, four months. And then bigger picture changes, such as looking at decentralizing the electricity grid and transitioning to renewable energy. Downstream at the point of consumption, um, there's a group of, for example, of 11 hospitals in Northeast United States that's looking at banding together and producing their own basic supply of medications so that they are not vulnerable to these external disruptions. Um, and another example is from following Hurricane Katrina, and an app was created called Healthcare Ready, which is real-time guidance on which healthcare centers and pharmacies are available at a given time. Um, and this has been particularly during COVID and vaccinations. Then moving on to oxygen. So my interest in oxygen was spurred by both the events of last year, both uh, COVID and Black Lives Matter. And I'm interested in the social life of oxygen uh, generally and specifically medical oxygen. How does this circulate? And I'm at the beginning of even identifying how these supply chains work. Um, but they have many commonalities with both blood and saline IV solution supply chains, for example. Um, and so I'm thinking, I suspect that the, there are going to be examples of where uh, cases where severe weather events have disrupted oxygen distribution. So an overview of what I've learned about how medical oxygen um, moves. And again, this is another supply chain that I had taken completely for granted. I thought it magically appeared at hospitals. Um, so in resource rich high income context, there are trucks of ox oxygen is trucked to hospitals in liquid form. Hospitals have on site oxygen plants where the liquid oxygen is turned to gaseous oxygen and then distributed through the walls of the hospital via pipes and each patient bed has an oxygen port. In low income context, this looks very different. There's a reliance on um, cylinders of oxygen. One of these cylinders would last an adult COVID patient one day on average costs about 100 US dollars and they are extremely cumbersome in and of themselves, but also they are often produced in capital cities. So a, a healthcare center has to arrange transport to pick up these cylinders, um, bring them back to the hospital, set them up, take them down when they're used and return them. Um, and there's fees attached to uh, rental of the, the, the cylinder itself. Um, there are, again, there's a concentration of uh, oxygen suppliers. So um, in sub-Saharan Africa, my understanding of that is that there's two major oxygen suppliers, uh, including the British Oxygen Company. And these two companies made pro each made profits of around $25 billion before COVID in 2019. So there are significant issues with how this medical supply chain um, works um, and the injustices embedded within it. There are numerous alternatives, fortunately. Um, for example, uh, options include using oxygen compressors. That's the unit um, on the floor in this photo uh, where ambient oxygen is drawn from the air. These um, require energy, um, so they often run on diesel generators, um, which would be um, 
not only bad for the climate, but also the air quality impacts in an area where people are having respiratory issues. Um, but organizations such as uh, MSF, Medicine Sans Frontières, are experimenting with using renewable energy sources to power these oxygen compressors. There's also been experiments with um, offering non uh, nonprofit production of oxygen um, in Kenya and um, creating on site oxygen production, such as we experience here in the UK. Um, in other countries such as Uganda. So I am in the midst of this research, um, uh, but the, for example, the recent shortages in India spark questions about anticipatory action in uh, the shortages in India were experienced in the context of one year into COVID and some, some knowns and unknowns around that. And then if you layer on a disruptive event such as a severe weather event, how might that intersect with these already difficult uh, uh, scenarios for supply chain provision? Uh, one oxygen plant manager in India stated essentially, dig, dig the well before you're thirsty. Um, so how can this be applied to vital mobilities of medical supply chains. And finally, moving on, um, looking forward, I'm looking at how to incorporate my work on vital mobilities with a green and just economic transition. What might that intersection look like? How can I in address, uh, acknowledge and address the social and racial inequities built into medical supply chains? and exploring the atmospheric anxieties, the ontological shock of uh, medical supplies that we take for granted, such as oxygen, such as saline IV solution, not being available when we expect it to be. And that mirrors an ontological shock of appreciating that we have the capacity to change, alter our, uh, the global climate upon which we rely. And so exploring these anxieties and then can I transform this into something more constructive, um, creating resilience in these vital mobility supply chains. And finally, some projects I'm working on that may be of interest to you or someone you know. Um, so uh, please spread the word. I uh, lead a mobile medical materials working group. We meet monthly and we've looked at materials ranging from breast milk um, to prep used in HIV prevention. Um, I'm also part of a project through the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute in partnership with UK Med and Save the Children that in the lead up to COP26, we're researching, conducting a scoping report, looking at the impacts of climate change on the humanitarian sector and asking what is the potential, what needs to change to create, to transform that landscape. And with that, I will conclude and welcome questions and comments and suggestions. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, many thanks, Stephanie. That was, um, yeah, I'm absolutely flabbergasted at some of the, the kind of, I think my first reaction is just shock at some of the, you know, the kind of lack of contingency planning and single points of failure and, and yeah, all those things. But um, can I uh, open it up to questions from colleagues? So would anyone like to ask the first question? Oh, oh uh, Matt, yeah. Um, uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, yeah, that was very interesting. I had two sorts of reactions, one of which was, second one, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to formulate particularly well yet, still formulating in my head. Um, but the first one was when you were talking about the Canadian Blood Services case and the, these regular flights, um, and the centralization on that issue. I was wondering on the carbon footprint side, how much of the total carbon footprint of that blood is accounted for by that, those journeys? Um, and so it's a, just as a sort of sense of a context of how much, for example, if you relocalized it, 
you would end up addressing that type that aspect of the issue um, and the the other sort of slightly more inchoate point is that there's quite a common critique of a reasonable chunk of sort of environmental discourse that at the moment especially in the sort of decolonial frame of it only we, we only really know we only really start to get worried when when white people from the west suddenly become vulnerable and i wondered how you reacted to that in relation to the sort of work that you're doing because it seems to me that it's i can see somebody saying that uh, uh that you get caught in that trap a little bit or not necessarily you do but if you like the problem the way that we suddenly paid attention to that broad that type of vulnerability is because it started to affect people in the global north uh and your south african examples sort of obviously pointing to that that dynamic so i wondered if you could say a bit more about that Mm, thanks, Matthew. Those are, um, those are great questions. I have not, in short, done a carbon breakdown of, say, a blood donation in Canada, the average blood donation. Um, I'd be interested to see what that would look like. Um, the flights I mentioned, that's just one component. So there's the person traveling to donate the blood. Um, and then the blood is broken, processed and broken down into three component parts, which could um, one component could stay in the same city as the donation um, or, or where it's manufactured, but other parts of that com the components of that blood donation could travel hundreds or thousands of kilometers, um, uh, say from uh, south to north British Columbia. Um, and then further, uh, if a component of my blood donation makes it to um, a remote part of Canada, of British Columbia and it's unused, uh, then that's flagged within two weeks, say of its expiry date, and that will be put back in the system and recirculated. So it paints this picture for me of this almost continuous circulation of blood products um, and where, the, where the, the footprint, there would be incredible variability in the carbon footprint of blood donations. Um, uh, and yeah, it would be interesting to see what the highs and lows of that would look like and also what a middle range would look like. Um, and then, yeah, if you add in the, the specialized blood, blood products made in um, South Carolina or Spain, that, 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 change, that impacts those figures as well. Um, so if anyone at Tyndall has that skill set so, in carbon uh, analysis, I'd be I was going to say, somebody at Tyndall knows how to do that. <laughs> I, I, this this qual a qualitative person needs your quantitative assistance. Um, yeah, and the point about um, uh, vulnerability and who is vulnerable when and when that starts to matter. And I, I'm struck that my entry point to this was um, very accidental, but it was the use of drones in Rwanda to transport blood products. Um, and so this is a way to overcome in Rwanda, uh, poor road infrastructure. Um, and uh, it's in a partnership between a California startup and the government of Rwanda for profit um, that is testing the use of drones for medical delivery um, with a view to expanding markets to Europe and North America for delivering stuff um, via drones. Um, so there's a whole range of things there in terms of how that research is being conducted, um, this like um, in situ live experiment with, um, with Rwanda um, in terms of that's framed as supporting their healthcare system um, and decreasing maternal mortality rates. So I think there, my starting point for this uh, research raised some of those questions about inequities and what that would, you know, never be allowed in a Canadian context, this kind of experimentation. Um, and I think COVID has brought to light with personal protective equipment, masks and other equipment, questions shone light on where supply chains, um, on supply chains period that they exist and also where these goods are produced, who is producing them, um, and um, what are their living conditions, health conditions. Um, so yeah, I think there's a, a big long thread there um, from the point of production to the point of consumption. Yeah, does that answer your question, Matthew? 
Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the, for provoking my thoughts on that. Could I invite Car Carly? You put a question in the chat. Could I invite you to? That's it. You sure can. Um, so yeah, hi, thanks for a great talk, really interesting. Um, I just wonder if you could reflect on how it's landed with stakeholders, you know, like, are you telling them things about their supply chains that they don't know and vulnerabilities that they don't know and, and kind of how does that, how does that go down? Is there an enthusiasm to like tackle that? Yeah, um, so I've started with some of that work. So uh, for example, I um, had conversations with people at Canadian Blood Services and the climate change layer seemed in my conversation not to be a fully acknowledged or embraced component of the picture, um, which I felt surprised by, but um, perhaps shouldn't have been. So, and how that's going to shift and change. So there's this push to centralize, 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 and how can we, which is, you know, that's one thing in the UK, it's another thing in Canada um, with with our winters and, uh, um, but that, that seemed to be the dominant narrative was consolidation and centralization and not, um, I didn't see any acknowledgement of climate change and severe weather events as a factor to be incorporated. Um, I did see, I should state, um, in one assessment uh, in Atlantic Canada of uh, centralization, they did cons consider the frequency of severe weather events, but that was within the, the norm of just rough winters in Atlantic Canada, not with a climate change lens. Um, working with the uh, NHS, um, with Richard Rackham, who's a contingency planner for uh, the NHS in blood and transplant services, um, and again, that seems to be similar um, he, in that, for example, Brexit forced a conversation about asking where do medical, where does medical equipment come from? How does it get from wherever it's made to the UK and how is that influenced by Brexit? But that seemed to open up the possibility of a conversation about what are, if if we can finally trace down these supply chains, because I got the sense it's like an inherited database, an inherited system that just passes from one set of hands to the next. And not many people have a full understanding of exactly where a given good comes from. Um, so that Brexit, an upside of Brexit is that it opened up this conversation about supply chains and layered onto that, um, they can now start saying, well, if there's a, an earthquake here or a hurricane here, can we layer that in so that we are apprised of that and can potentially anticipate shortages? Um, so that conversation seems to have started in some factions. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Carly? I think you froze. <laughs> so I'll pretend that did. <laughs> uh, can I invite um, Jace to, because Jace has put a question in the chat. Thanks, Jace. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you. That's a really uh, fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, really opened my eyes. Um, I think you have touched in your presentation uh, um, about uh, the situation from the uh, developing world or the low-income countries. Uh, I'm really uh, curious about the sort of uh, the NGOs and grassroots organizations, how they are responding uh, under extreme weather conditions, and they're probably how more severe uh, climate impacts compared to uh, in, the, in the Western world. And um, so the, the bottom of the grassroots organizations, how they are responding it. And are there any lessons uh, for the global North uh, from them mm. uh, as the, the, the extreme weather is only increasing and we, we, are, uh, we are only witnessing increasing. So are there any lessons and uh, any more case studies in the uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Such a good question. Um, I'm thinking through some of this in a current paper I'm writing on oxygen supply chains. So before COVID, before we even knew that word, there was um, a recognition in lower income contexts, um, sub-Saharan Africa, that there were widespread oxygen shortages. So hospitals, it, it was an acknowledged issue before COVID that that was an issue. So there were um, 
a variety of initiatives. initiatives. Um, there's a One Breath Coalition. Um, there's a uh, which is a larger organization um, that's looking at how to improve oxygen um, availability in various countries. There's another example, and I'm not going to remember which country off the top of my head, I want to say Kenya, um, where doctors working in hospitals, experiencing those shortages, they took the initiative to get the funding to create a nonprofit oxygen plant in their community. Um, and that has since, uh, that was a success and has been scaled up to, I think, three oxygen plants at this point. So that those were, those were the people on the front lines encountering, who would encounter those um, shortages on a day-to-day -day basis and um, hit a point that they wanted to do something else and were able to make that happen. That's not in response to the severe weather events specifically, and I don't have an answer for that right now. I think that's something I'd be interested in learning more about. And if anyone has any specific uh, examples to share I, um, from your own research, I'd be interested. The cases that I have come across specifically relate to oxygen and um, it, not inspired by uh, severe weather events, just the, um, everyday oxygen shortages. Um, but questions about, in terms of the lessons from the Global South to the Global North, um, to taking things into their own hands and um, questioning the profit margins of these large corporations and the reliance on transport to capital cities. There's um, efforts within these communities to localize um, and change the, the business model of those supply chains. And I think, um, yeah, those are questions that we could start asking um, in the Global North. The oxygen costs four to five times more in the Global South than in the Global North um, because of the way the these corporations work. Um, so thanks, JC, for giving me something to think about more there. Are there other questions at the moment or sh can I jump in and ask a question? <laughs> I'll just I'll mention I posted um, it to uh, the illustration that I've created of my blood research. It's a it's the uh, like a three minute read of my blood research in the chat. Um, so if you need a fantastic in making friends with a cartoon blood drop, this is your chance. <laughs> mm. I I was wondering how much so I mean certainly in for lots of I suppose utilities or companies in the UK, there seems to be a split between, um, I suppose, business continuity. So resilience means business continuity. Resilience doesn't necessarily mean adaptation and planning for things to change in the future. You want to kind of, you want to maintain, you want to maintain your current function and you either don't have the mandate, the funding or the, the regulatory pressure to kind of to look forward and think about how say climate change would change things going forward I, I wondered if that was something that you'd also found in in your research yeah thank you um so in the flood, flooding of that filton facility near bristol um the focus was understandably on contingency making sure that the blood could be collected processed and and um um, shipped to hospitals um, and the behind the scenes what um, the, the adaptation I'm not sure how that facility was adapted um, for flooding events as a result of that um, but in that case contingency was very much about um, uh, sorry continuity um, was the the version of resilience um, uh, being implemented, ideas about like decentralizing, um, leaning away from decentralized, um, that's resisted um, because there are efficiencies, economic efficiencies and also um, practical efficiencies um, that I don't quite have my head around in this centralized uh, approach. Um, so uh, adapting through decentralization, that does not seem to be on the radar. Um, yeah, 
So I guess my experience from the field affirms your interpretation, Sarah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, and how to spark a shift. Um, there's an example of uh, blood bags. This was before COVID, so I'm not sure if this went actually through, but the, the plastic bag, when you donate blood and your blood goes into that plastic bag, that bag was initially produced in Poland and shipped to the UK, but there was um, a plan that was being explored um, that I think would have been motivated by decreasing costs to produce those bags in Tunisia, send them to Poland for assembling, and then transport them to the UK for use. So that to me <laughs> speaks to something that is very much focused on continuity combined with the bottom line mm. and not carbon footprint um, uh, or adaptation. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'd, I'd agree, <laughs> definitely agree with that. Are there any other further questions from, from colleagues? Okay. Um, so, I mean, do you have any sort of final kind of sort of insights or points that you'd like to share with us, Stephanie? Hmm. Well, I really appreciate you stoking my thinking now that I've finished teaching for the semester and I'm switching back into research. You helped um, stoke my thinking. I'm teaching two courses. I just finished a course, Disaster Mobilities of Climate Change. And next year, I'm teaching a course on vital mobilities, delivering healthcare in a changing climate. So if that resonates with anyone here, um, in terms of, I don't know what, collaboration, synergies, um, materials that could be of use. Um, I'll just put that out there, yeah. Brilliant. If, if you had kind of any key messages for COP26 from your work, <laughs> what, what would that be? Oh my gosh, that's such an obvious and hard question. Um, I, do you know, I have not thought of that, but on the spot, Oh my goodness. Carly. I, I, I just thought, what, what, a, what a dreadfully hard question to drop. <laughs> out. I was going to suggest that Stephanie threw it back at you while she was thinking of her own answer. Uh, but I'm hoping now that this time might have just allowed Stephanie a little bit more time to consult. Thanks, Carly. Solidarity. <laughs> Oh, Matt, do you want to come in? I mean, I, I would have thought that, uh, it, I mean, you've obviously got the medical specificities which make it really acute because it, you, it's a nice focus on, on it being life or death type questions uh, in the immediate medical context. But I think you've got also, you've got a sort of generalizable story, it seems to me, about the vulnerability of supply chains. Mm. Um, and that I'm sure, I mean, in the UK, you've got the obvious connection that it's also accentuated by the Brexit conversation. As you say, that sort of actually made the British state think about this in a way that maybe other states aren't. Certainly you're, I mean, when you said you, you, you were initially surprised that the Canadian Blood Services hadn't thought about it. And then you said, maybe I shouldn't have eaten. I was going, oh yeah, <laughs> nothing I know about the Canadian state shows that it's paying any attention to any of that level of detail um, of cl about climate impacts. But I think then you could sit there and say, you really need to be looking at the ways in which things that you depend on for quite mundane stuff, whether that's medical materials, food, uh, plastic, you know, sort of plastic bags for specific purposes that may know that if, uh, if those are going to be, as they become more extensive supply chains, as in your UK, Poland, Tunisia, and maybe somewhere else as well, uh, down the line, then they become more, every, every point in that chain, if it's got a flooding or a hurricane or a, uh, an ice storm or a, uh, whatever, then, then that increases the vulnerability as those types of events become more regular. So I think that's a really good general, you know, and so that it's just a sort of, you need to be in that planning technologies you've got great material for that and also maybe the sort of the daftness of what sarah was saying about how how british companies are thinking about resi being resilient right it's just like it's a way of what resilient means is finding a way not to change rather than actually that that's actually going to be mm. yeah, dreadfully that's, naive 
That's really well put. I think what appealed me to me about this topic was an experience I had a number of years ago of going to refill a regular prescription at the pharmacy. And they said that's not a, that version is not available right now. There's supply chain issues. Yeah. And I think what appeals to me about this topic, and I would hope would appeal to the general public, to decision makers, is we many of us rely on a medication or have a loved one who relies on a medication. And we're seeing this, an extreme version of this, say in India where people rely on oxygen, but this is, this is up close and personal. This is, um, this is the, the well-being of you and your family and loved ones and um, experiences of families in the global south are no different from this um so making that you know connection of care so a caring paradigm um i think is yeah. um accessible and compelling um so i think i would lead with an argument like that at cop 26 thanks for the hard question sarah mander i'll remember that all right <laughs> <laughs> uh, well it was it was there as a provocation, and your your most excellent colleagues um, stepped in and answered and oh, yeah. crowdsourced some 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 fantastic ideas. I think I was going to in um, electricity consumption. Sometimes we talk about the fact that it's only when you get a power cut kind of thing is it's the crisis that makes the invisible visible, and I think very much that's what's what's come from from this actually, and until and yeah. And it's the importance of actually not waiting for that crisis to kind of look to, to look more deeply and see things that you should be seeing anyway. I'm hoping that the COVID, the experiences of shortages throughout various supply chains and COVID, you know, will that translate to something that endures past uh, the COVID itself and ask, prompt society to ask these questions? Um, yeah, thanks, Sarah. I think that's a great place to, um, unless there's any further contributions. Uh, no, in that case, I would just like to thank everyone for coming. Thank very much, Stephanie, <laughs> for a, a kind of a visually amazing and really interesting presentation. It was fantastic. Um, and then just to also, our next Tyndall seminar will be on the 26th of June at the usual time when we will be hearing from um, Henry McGee speaking about museums and sustainable, sustainable development goals. So thanks very much.